Right, so moving along, um, it's uh, my pleasure now to introduce Natalie Van Goetz uh, from the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health in Switzerland. Um, she's going to address a subject area which has implications in a lot of what we do, um, how we deal with interdependent parameters. And she's going to talk about, as exemplified by PBBK modeling for a risk assessment. Um, I've worked with Natalie on a number of projects, and um, I truly look forward to hearing what you have to say in the area. Thanks, Betty, for the very nice introduction. Um, I would like to add to this a little bit because um, unlike my pre-lecturers, um, pre-speakers, I will now go into the nitty-gritty details of what a poor risk assessor has to do when they want to do an uncertainty assessment. <laughs> and this might look sometimes a little bit um, uninteresting, I don't know, but it's, it's how the real world looks like when you're a risk assessor or an exposure assessor in my um, personal life um, and has to do, have to do the, the uncertainty assessment. Where were these things where I can move? So essentially, um, obviously, it was not um, mainly me who did this, but my PhD student, Cecile Cara, who developed um, PPPK models for bisphenols. So this was our main goal. We wanted to look into the details of how bisphenols that are used as substitutes now for bisphenol A work in the human body and whether they might pose a higher risk than bisphenol A. So this was our main goal. The uncertainty assessment that I will present here, we did because as modelers, obviously, we always want to know how good is my model, what are the uncertainties in the model. Oh, yeah, this looks different from, yeah, but not, not a problem. So um, most statistical methods, at least the classical ones, the frequentist ones, um, they require independence of parameters. So whenever we have a dependency between parameters, we have to think of an ad ad uh, um, additional criterion how to deal with this. Dependence can take different forms. Um, um, the criterion depends on what kind of dependence I find. And in the first part of my talk, I want to give you an overview about the methods that we are using. And then in the um, second part, I want to come to the case study that I would like to present. And then I'm very happy that um, John Paul has already introduced a little bit about PPPK models and how they look like and also the kind of functions. So you will see these again. Um, I want to start with how we are calculating internal exposure before we come to the PPPK modeling. And I am using this example because it's much easier to show you the methods with this example because the parameters are just multiplied, so it's very easy to understand how the method work, works. So imagine a source. I think not all of us are exposure modelers here in the room. Um, imagine a source um, and a substance inside the source that can be taken up by different intake routes, oral inhalation dermal, for example. It ends up in the body, and then we calculate a dose. So if we think of the source with the concentration, um, C, X, and the quantity, of the source that is taken in, these are independent parameters. Also, the body weight, this is completely independent, and perhaps not completely independent, the Q is maybe a little bit dependent. Um, yeah, I need more energy when I have a higher body weight, but it's, it's not a big deal. And also, the um, uptake fraction, the Fy, is mostly independent, so these can be treated very easily by um, frequentist methods that have been applied regularly. For example, a probabilistic assessment using 1D Monte Carlo. What we do when we do a 1D Monte Carlo um, probabilistic approach is that we think of all the parameters that we have here in the equation as having a distribution of parameters. And then we perform multiple steps of Monte Carlo assessment. For example, a thousand steps. And for each of the steps, I pick one parameter value from the distribution that I have, put them together, calculate my dose, and this I do these thousand steps, and then I have my probability density function, as John Paul already introduced. And um, I also want to mention again, 
what we are using here and what I will show later also are cumulative distribution functions. They can be easily assessed by adding up the different probabilities that we have in the probability density function. So this is what we do when we assess variability with the probabil um, probabilistic method. Um, what has been done before and often is done is that we can also assess uncertainty by overlaying laying a distribution on the 1D Monte Carlo method. We put, again, distributions on the different parameters that we have here so that we have an additional um, distribution for the uncertainty. It's a little bit like these error bars upon error bars, which were <laughs> also very nicely shown before, but I think there is some merit in this because we can also put um, distributions behind it so the error bars don't come out of the blue, but we have underlying data to um, make distributions here. So this two is the 2D Monte Carlo method that we were using in the case study that I will show now, and what we can do then is we have a cumulative density, not only one cumulative density um, uh, distribution function, but we have several, and the spread of the um, cumulative distribution functions shows me my uncertainty. So the larger the spread, the larger my uncertainty. Now, when we are thinking, we, we were discussing now one source, now we have multiple sources, like, which is the case in our daily life. And what happens then is that the parameters that we are looking at, they become dependent because um, I cannot eat two kilograms of noodles and two kilograms of bread at the same day. Very simple as that. And maybe also when I eat noodles, I often eat tomato sauce with them. So there is a dependency between the Q parameters and I have to take this into account. The solution for these interdependent date um, parameters that I was showing just now, the Qs, um, is either I use better data. So for example, EFSA uses um, often the individual-based dietary data. So for every day, um, I'm just modeling a specific individual, then I don't have this problem. But I don't have this data all the time. Um, in the food area, we often have this data, but I'm mainly involved with consumer exposures that um, deal also with um, not so frequent exposures like cosmetics or whatever, and there often we don't have this data. So what we can do is that we define some boundaries. And obviously, staying with the food, we can define um, maximum caloric intake, and we have done some work showing that you are not so far away from the, the ideal method, the individual-based method. If you look here at the, um, at the table, to the left, we have, is it to the left? Yeah. Um, to, to the left, we have the ideal method, and you only need to look quickly at the P50 from females, males. To the, in the middle, we have the energy-based method, which is the one with the caloric intake boundary, and here it's quite similar. It's a little bit different, but we can deal with this. It's, it's not, not, not uh, such a big difference. Okay, so these are the little tricks that we can use. And now I want to come to my case study that I want to share with you. And this is about not about exposure modeling. That is my normally normal business, but it's about PBPK modeling for bisphenols. And we were looking at bisphenol A, for which there's plenty of data, as was already said before. But for the substitutes that are now on the market and are being used, for example, in thermal paper, BPS, or BPF as the canning, um, lining of cans, we don't have so much data and we don't have so much information. So we really would like to transform our knowledge about what we know about BPA also into knowledge about the substitutes. So um, as said, I don't want to focus here on the PBBK model development that we did, but I want to show you how we did the uncertainty assessment. 
So our first step was a qualitative uncertainty assessment of all model parameters, and was, which was also said before by John Paul, there's a multitude of parameters in such a PBPK model. It's not only 10 or so, but it's 30, 40, and some of them are very well established parameters that um, date from 1994, for example, from the IPCP model, where you have the different organ weights and all of this inside. So there's a lot of parameters in these models. And we did a qualitative uncertainty assessment of all these model parameters, at least for groups of them. And then we decided on the basis of this qualitative assessment for which parameters we wanted to do a quantitative assessment. And at least for the, um, for the bisphenol A substitutes, um, the partition coefficients were not um, accessible from animal studies or so, but we had to use QSAR, so these are highly uncertain. And also the metabolism parameters are quite important in the case of bisphenol A, so they are also taken into account in the quantitative assessment and uptake and excretion parameters. And you will realize the different colors. In blue, these are um, non-dependent parameters, and the metabolism parameters are dependent from each other, and this is why I want to focus on these. And I'm show you how we try to deal with the um, dependency here. So this was our PBPK model. It's a generic model um, based on Eddington et al. And here we have, um, in the blue part, our mostly um, independent parameters, and here in the red part, the metabolization. And the metabolization is very important for bisphenols because they, um, they are detoxificated in the, um, in the liver and in the intestines after oral uptake, but they are not detoxified or at least only when they reach the liver after intravenous injection, dermal uptake, or inhalation. So this is a big difference. And when we take into account the different uptake routes, we also have to take into account different metabolization. So these are really crucial um, for the exposure assessment afterwards. And um, what is often done, and also here, um, Michael S. Menten kinetics are used for the glucuronidation in liver and gut. And for these, um, at least for BPA, there is a number of data. For the others, there's um, less data, but for BPA, we had quite um, an array of in vitro data available. And what we did then, um, you will see from these different data that the KM and the Vmax are to some extent correlated. This has not, or it's not really known whether this is um, this has any physiological basis. It might just be that in the in vitro methods they did not have enough points, so it might just be a question of the model. So, but nevertheless, when we look at the data, we have a dependency. And what we did then was that we defined um, boundaries, upper and lower boundaries, and we used the, the curves that we had. So we just took the different curves, put and um, de defined these as the lower and upper boundaries for our Vmax. And then the procedure was that we selected a Vmax and a Km independent of each other. And then in the inner loop, we selected the Km and then um, calculated boundaries for the respective Vmax so that um, we, we don't get completely different KMs and Vmaxes. And this I will very quickly introduce because I have only two minutes left. Um, <laughs> um, as you know, in PBPK modeling, mostly we have a deterministic model that we rely on, and this was also the case here. Um, we identified first the model on the basis of the in vitro data and all of this, but for bisphenol A and bisphenol S, we had also data available um, from biomonitoring. So in the end, we did some calibration. And the calibration, obviously, was um, we used these um, uh, functions. OK, so now coming to my results, <laughs> um, at, least, at last. So, and um, the interesting point I want to show you is 
First, we have the uncertainty assessment here. So you see the dotted lines. We will focus only on this line, which is for the BPS. And the dotted lines here span the uncertainty range. And here you find that we have this bold curve, which lies outside the uncertainty range. This is because the bold line is the basic model that we used. And the basic model is already calibrated. But we did the, um, the uncertainty assessment for the uncalibrated. And now you might ask me why we did this and why we did not um, take into account the uncertainty around the calibrated model. And this is because um, in the end, with the calibration of the model, we lose every um, real attachment to the parameters that we had before. So if I look at the, um, at the model that I have uncalibrated, I am pretty sure about the, um, the variability of the, of the experiments that lie beyond, but if I apply a calibration afterwards, this calibration relates to many more parameters that then are um, calibrated or they are um, made different afterwards. And obviously, this is a problem. It's very difficult, at least in my point of view, um, to take into account the uncertainty that arises when we come from in vitro to real life situations like we have in biomonitoring. And now, what do we learn from this in my perspective? So I learned at least that for me, the qualitative assessment of uncertainties is at least as important as the quantitative assessment because with the qualitative, I can assess many more types of uncertainty. And as you see, um, it was very difficult for us to think of a way to quantify in frequentist statistics the uncertainties that I get from when I go from in vitro to in vivo situations in humans. And also, um, I think even if we, um, I will put this um, point also, Bayesian statistics, as you have heard before, might be much more straightforward in including these uncertainties that we have left out in the 2D Monte Carlo. Um, but the, I think that what we learned here with the quantitative assessment is that we need to know much more about how the, or which parameters are changed really when we come from in vitro to in vivo model, models. Thank you, and sorry if I'm a little bit too concerned. Uh, thanks very much, Natalie, for that presentation. Um, we have time for maybe one question. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. As I, I, I understand the, the, the big work and the big brain squeezing that is behind this work. Uh, I fully agree with your um, first sentence in this slide. Problem formulation also needed for uncertainty assessment. My question is, considering uh, the uh, specific chemical, bisphenol A, and considering that uh, uh, the effects on development are the most critical, apparently, for risk assessment. Um, was the um, metabolism um, and kinetics uh, during pregnancy considered uh, in the uncertainty assessment? Yeah, obviously, this is a very important question. And in this model, we did not include the fetus. Um, another group is working on this, um, um, Vika Skuma, for example, in, in Spain. But here, the uncertainty assessment um, we did for, pregnant, uh, for, for women of childbearing age, at least. So we also discerned this uh, specific age group as a very important one. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.